Okay, I'm not sure if the stream is uh, working. I guess it is working now. Okay, I see it. Okay, let's give it some short time and then we'll start. Just give me a second here. Okay. Okay, I think we can get started. Cool, so welcome to lecture 17 uh, of digital design and computer architecture. We're uh, almost uh, more than two thirds of the semester over and we've covered a lot of exciting topics. Uh, we're gonna cover even more uh, starting today. Uh, this will first start with, we'll first start with data flow and uh, superscalar execution. And you, data flow, you probably remember, uh, this is going to be mostly review, but it's a timely review because we've already seen how out of order execution processors work. And this is going to be more of a reminder of why out of order execution is so successful underneath and why data flow has not been as successful. Uh, but the concepts are conceptually essentially the same. Underneath we're executing things, uh, instructions in a data flow out order in an out of order execution processor. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, uh, there, uh, these are the required readings. So this has been, uh, this is no news. I think this, you, you've been seeing this, you've, you've seen this many times before. Uh, we're, we've been covering this microarchitecture of superscalar processors in many different lectures. And Harris and Harris has some treatment, as you know. Uh, and McFarling's uh, combining branch predictors tutorial, let's say, and also research paper, we'll cover it in lecture 17b and probably into lecture 18 next week as well. Okay, uh, remember we've covered all of these different microarchitecture paradigms and we've improved the performance of a system significantly. Uh, and finally, we ended up with out-of-order execution. Yesterday, uh, we had a review of out-of-order execution in the beginning. You didn't have to watch that part. And later we actually uh, went into more detail on how out-of-order execution operates and how load store engine works. As I mentioned in the lecture, you're not going to be responsible for how load store uh, unit operates in exams, et cetera, but it's important to know uh, for, for, for really understanding how an out of order engine operates, it's, uh, it's really important to cover uh, that. In, in many uh, uh, classes, I think people cover uh, adds, multiplies, et cetera, to show how out of order execution operates, but uh, without covering loads and stores, I think you don't do a full treatment of how that engine works. And we will cover loads and stores more uh, going into the future, actually, uh, in these lectures, as you will see. Now let's jump into other execution paradigms, briefly at least, before we cover control dependence prediction, which is branch prediction. And then we will go back to other execution paradigms. And we're going to cover a lot of other execution paradigms. In fact, we've been covering them. Clearly, the pipelining is actually an execution paradigm, meaning it's an approach to how to get more concurrency out of your machine. Uh, and this is instruction level concurrency. And fine grained multi threading is another execution paradigm, actually, we will see again in GPUs. We covered it as a way of avoiding control and data dependencies, as you know. And it's going to be a, another way of, uh, we will discuss briefly today. But it's also an execution paradigm because it enables multi threaded execution at a very fine grained level. And it's, it's also an approach to instruction level concurrency. You'd execute different instructions in your pipeline, except those instructions happen to be from different threads, right? And we've covered out over execution. And we, today we're going to cover a little bit more on data flow at the ISA level. It's going to be mostly a review of data flow, but hopefully with a different perspective, uh, as I mentioned. And then we're going to cover data superscalar execution, which is important to cover because it's very tightly tied together uh, with improving performance in a machine you, that uses out of order execution in general, even though they're completely orthogonal concepts. Uh, and then we're going to move into a branch prediction. And later on, we're going to cover the remaining execution paradigms, which are quite exciting. As you can see, VLIW, SIMD processing, vector and array processors, GPUs are examples of SIMD processing, decoupled access execute, and systolic arrays. And all of these ideas are employed in different parts of the computing domain today. So for example, GPUs employ SIMD processing for sure, VLIW, they employ VLIW, they employ fine-grained multi-threading, they employ pipelining. So one processor can actually employ many of these different uh, approaches to concurrency to maximize performance and efficiency. And clearly systolic arrays, as we mentioned earlier, at the high level is employed in uh, many 
uh, machine learning accelerators today. So we're going to talk about the principles of systolic arrays uh, in a later lecture, not this week for sure. OK, so let's review data flow uh, with the new understanding we got from out of order execution uh, last week and yesterday. And remember, data flow was all about exploiting irregular parallelism. If parallelism is not easy to find in your program, let's say by a compiler, scheduling instructions is not easy uh, then by a compiler, as we discussed in an earlier lecture. Uh, but uh, hardware can easily find and schedule those instructions automatically, if you will, in a very irregular manner. Dependencies might occur at different points in the program. And if you have a large enough data flow engine or large enough window in an out of order execution processor, then you'll be able to capture and fi find uh, and capture those independent instructions and execute them concurrently while some other instructions are waiting for their dependencies to be resolved. And essentially, this, is, this could be completely irregular. There could be no predictability to the, reg uh, to the parallelism in this particular case. And data flow, this is where data flow paradigm really shines at. If you cannot uncover parallelism in a regular way, uh, data flow can come to your rescue because it really identifies parallel instructions where parallelism is really uh, not findable in some other way in, 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 in regular, using regular methods. And remember, uh, this was a slide from yesterday, actually, out of order execution is a restricted data flow uh, paradigm, let's say. An out of order engine dynamically builds a data flow graph of a piece of the program. And that piece, that data flow graph that uh, the out of order execution engine builds and executes is limited to the instruction window. We defined this also in uh, previous lectures. Instruction window is really all decoded, but not yet retired instructions. And by looking at the instruction window and the reservation stations uh, and reorder buffer as well, and the register file, of course, as, as, we, do, as we have done, you can basically reconstruct uh, the program mostly. Uh, you may not be able to perfectly construct the exact order, sequential order of instructions, because remember, this is data flow graph. Data flow graph doesn't, by nature, have sequential ordering, as we have discussed earlier, and as we, I'm going to put, uh, again, a reminder slide of. Uh, basically, you can reconstruct, you can reverse engineer uh, the data flow graph of a machine. And if you're lucky, you can also reverse engineer the sequential order of instructions with some other hints that you may have in other parts of the machine. So this is very powerful. And this, essentially, the fact that you can reconstruct the data flow graph uh, of a program shows that uh, the out of order engine is essentially a restricted data flow machine. Uh, OK, then we also discussed two questions, which I'm not going to go into, because this, this actually has uh, generated a lot of research. Can we somehow do it for the whole program? Can we actually uh, construct uh, the uh, data flow graph and essentially have large reservation stations, large instruction window, large physical register files, et cetera. Uh, certainly you can potentially, but then you're limited by the complexity and the power and the energy uh, consumed by all of those uh, buses and structures that we have built in the last lecture, right? The tag matching logic, for example, is quite complex. And, and, and of course, the load store unit becomes even more complex, right? If you want to do it, let's say, for the entire program, and the entire program has 200,000 instructions, that's a small program, by the way, uh, because this is dynamic instructions we're talking about, right? 200,000 instructions. Then it's going to be uh, quite uh, challenging to really build that instruction window as we discussed last time. And also you may not need it for the entire 200,000 instructions because your latencies may not be as large, right? But again, if you want to actually think uh, critically and think deeper, maybe your latencies are quite large actually. If you want to tolerate the latency of an SSD, solid state drive, which is on the order of microseconds uh, today, you may actually uh, need uh, that sort of data flow engine uh, in your system. Think about it. Uh, today's systems actually don't even try to tolerate the uh, access to a solid state drive, right? Whenever a process is executing, uh, when you get a memory access, you don't switch out the process. But when you get a IO access, which goes to the SSD, normally the operating system suspends the process and wakes it up later uh, when the, pro uh, when the uh, result from the IO storage device comes back. Right? But that doesn't have to be uh, the only way of handling IO requests. So, so there is benefit potentially to actually increasing the instruction window uh, to be quite large so that you can tolerate many, many latencies that we have in our system today. 
Okay, we also discussed, can we do it efficiently with Thomas Sowell's algorithm? Uh, and I already kind of answered that, but you can also uh, look at yesterday's uh, lecture as well. So I recall in the, yesterday's lecture by just looking at, carefully looking at the state of the register alias table uh, and the reservation stations in cycle seven in the machine we simulated, we were able to reverse engineer completely the data flow graph of the machine. And uh, I left it as an exercise to you, but you could actually go from the data flow graph to the sequential instruction order by thinking a little bit more about how the dependencies are uh, and how the uh, values are, et cetera. But I'm not going to do that uh, at this. Uh, I didn't do that yesterday, but you can also leave it. Uh, you, you can do it as an exercise for yourself. OK, so a data flow. To summarize the data flow paradigm, as we discussed, availability of data determines order of execution. Essentially, there is no centralized control uh, uh, sequencing that happens. There's no program counter, as we discussed earlier. I'm going to say that again. Uh, but basically, at the core of an out-of-order engine, uh, your, the availability of your source operands determines whether the, uh, the instruction can execute. Uh, and you can think of the instruction as the data flow node, which we did. Uh, and you can look at the slide, for example, the each instruction is a data flow node over here, as you can see, and can figure out what type of instruction it is based on which reservation station it is sitting at, as you can see. And you can reverse engineer the sources, as we have discussed, by, by looking at the tags and uh, how uh, the different tags are linked to different values and reservation stations. Basically, a data flow node, an instruction fires when all of its sources are ready. And programs are represented as data flow graphs of nodes. This is data flow at the ISA level. In the ISA level, you pre represent the programs as data flow graphs. Uh, but Thomas Sowell's algorithm, uh, of course, doesn't do that. Uh, basically, in an out-of-order machine, we're still obeying the von Neumann model. Programs are represented as sequential flow of instructions, as we have seen. And out-of-order execution builds this data flow graph. Whereas in a real data flow machine at the ISA level, you actually don't have a sequential notion of execution, as we discussed. right? But uh, we also mentioned that data flow at the ISA level has not been successful. I, I say as over here, but you can, you can safely remove that as. It has not been successful, period, basically. Uh, there are no real machines uh, that, are commercially, that have been commercially successful that had this data flow model at the instruction set architecture level where the programmers needed to program uh, using data flow graphs and compilers needed to compile into data flow graphs, of course, with some instruction specifications, right? Uh, and it has not been successful because basically it required changing all of the software stack uh, and rewriting all of the programs uh, using that new style of execution and new instructions at architecture. And that is a huge effort, of course, right? As you, as you can imagine, right? Because one Neumann model was already uh, quite successful when data flow principles were brought up in 1974 and beyond. And people tried to make data flow quite successful but the requirement to change the ISA and the entire software stack uh, was too, too much, essentially. And also, at the same time, people figured out how to employ the data flow principles at the microarchitecture level. This was done in the early 80s, mid-1980s, as we have discussed in the last lecture, while preserving the von Neumann model semantics. So if you can do that, uh, what you're doing is basically say, telling the programmer, programmer, you don't need to change anything. Compilers, none of the software stack needs to change. But I'm going to get some of the benefits of data flow execution, which is uh, independent execution, uh, uh, concurrent execution of independent instructions and latency tolerance benefits. Uh, then it's a very powerful proposition commercially also, right? Because nobody essentially needs to change at the software. You just need to change the microarchitecture. And as a result, this has been extremely successful. And out of word execution is really a prime example of this as we covered it last time. And people have actually uh, uh, tried to make out of order execution even more efficient, which we didn't go into. For example, how do you make tag matching logic more efficient? How do you make renaming more efficient? How do you, make, how do you minimize the storage of values? We've discussed that briefly yesterday, but we didn't really go into a whole lot of detail. There are a lot more tricks you can play. How do you minimize the storage for registers? How do you uh, um, make load store handling logic more, even more efficient than what we have discussed last time? So there has been a lot of research plus engineering that has happened over the course of last 30, 35 years 
uh, since this was first implemented, basically. And th with this uh, auto word execution was first commercially successful with Intel Pentium Pro, as we discussed, and essentially all high performance machines implemented today. Okay, recall the slide. This slide uh, may actually resonate better right now. This was from lecture 11 uh, this year uh, in digital design and computer architecture. And I challenged you at that time asking the question, do we really need to have a program counter in the ISA? And the answer, uh, if you give the answer yes, then you have something like a von Neumann model, right? Control driven sequential execution. And if the answer is no, one potential answer is data driven parallel execution. And data flow is an example of this, the prime example of it, right? And as I mentioned, trade offs are very high level ones, right? Now, hopefully, it's more clear. Basically, ease of programming is it easier to program in a data flow graph or sequential? And at that time, I think. Uh, we also discussed it, but uh, many people said uh, it was sequential. Uh, and it's probably hasn't changed that much, but it could be due to the education as well, as we discussed at that time. Uh, certainly, it's good to think about this, right? Uh, ease of compilation. Uh, certainly, we know how to compile code for sequential execution. Do we really know how to compile code for data flow graphs? That's going to be interesting going into the future, I think. Not because data flow is successful at the ISA level, but because data flow paradigm is also becoming more important for reconfigurable architectures. So you're doing FPGA uh, programming in your labs, for example, and you're building a, a von Neumann architecture on top of an FPGA. But another way of taking advantage of FPGAs, as we discussed in an earlier lecture when we discussed the labs, I think that was lecture three, uh, for example, uh, when, uh, is that you take a, a program and compile a, a portion of its data flow graph on an FPGA and essentially instantiate the data flow graph as execution units and wires that connect those execution units on that FPGA because it's reconfigurable, right? Essentially, if you do that, then you're actually doing data flow execution of a part of a program on the FPGA. And that's extremely fast, of course, as you can imagine. You can also try it actually with the FPGAs you have if you have free time. Uh, that's extremely fast. But of course, it requires some sort of either compilation or programming of this data flow graph into the machine. So you need to come up with a data flow graph basically to do that. And of course, the efficiency at which you create the data flow graph becomes very important. You can always create a data flow graph, right? The question is how efficient will it be? And performance is uh, something we discussed also. Clearly, data flow execution gives you a lot of parallelism, but it comes at the cost of hardware complexity also. And you've seen this uh, in out of order execution, right? Out of order execution is restricted data flow. Clearly, it can execute independent instructions. Uh, very nicely, and it gives you parallelism across those independent instructions. But the hardware complexity compared to uh, the earlier types of machines that we have seen, pipelining, for example, really increased significantly. We didn't quantify it, and it's not really, really easy to quantify, and it's not that important to exactly quantify the hardware complexity. We didn't quantify even performance, actually, if you think about it. But people have benchmarked uh, out of order execution performance a lot, and their papers are written on hardware complexity. But certainly, hardware complexity of an out of order execution engine is much higher. But uh, clearly, people are building these machines, so it's not impossible. But if you really want to scale up to uh, larger uh, data flow graphs, it's going to be more and more challenging. So, this is an exciting time, actually, because people are building larger and larger machines uh, today. Uh, and uh, and I, I mentioned uh, Apple M1 as an example. Uh, of that, and you can you can find articles on Apple M1's microarchitecture uh, online uh, if you're interested. Okay, so pure data flow. Let's talk about advances and disadvantages of ISA level or pure data flow. Essentially, uh, ISA level data flow is very good at exploiting irregular parallelism. Only real dependencies constrain processing, and you can expose more parallelism at the ISA level than the von Neumann model. And I think this is hopefully obvious. Of course, it comes with a lot of disadvantages at the ISA level. And uh, we've uh, briefly mentioned that when we talk about precise uh, uh, exceptions. But certainly, if, you have, if all you have is a data flow graph uh, and no, no ordering between instructions, then you don't have a precise state semantics right, uh, built into your programs. As a result, uh, why you don't have it? Because uh, there is no ordering between instructions. right? Uh, when an instruction faults, you have no idea what part of the data flow graph executed and what part didn't execute. As a result, because you don't have this precise state semantics, debugging data flow machines is extremely difficult. And also, on top of this, you don't get the benefits of uh, what precise state semantics and precise exceptions enables, like precise interrupt and exception handling, right? Uh, uh, 
Uh, so basically, because you don't have precise state semantics. So you need to somehow solve these problems. And it's very difficult to solve these problems without giving up from some of the data flow principles, basically. Let me put it that way. I don't want to go into more detail because clearly uh, this is a research problem right now that people are not trying to solve as much. In the past, they were trying to solve, it, uh, solve this a little bit more. So other issues uh, over here include, uh, let me actually do this over here, basically too much parallelism potentially. So if you have the entire data flow graph of a, of a program or the system, uh, usually these machines require parallelism control. So this may be a good thing you think. You think that, oh, I'm exploiting a lot of parallelism. But then uh, you, uh, it's, it's so much parallelism that uh, you need hardware to actually handle that parallelism. And that requires a lot of tag matching logic, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, we're not going to get into that, but this becomes quite expensive. Uh, and as a result, you need high bookkeeping overhead. So you can imagine, you can, uh, you can resonate th with this when we talk about the tag matching logic and uh, storage that is needed for values, for example. All of these are uh, done in an out-of-order processor, but in a data flow processor at the ISA level, it becomes even harder, actually, because you need a lot more tag matching, a lot more data storage, and you can even uh, not control the parallels. Right? OK, there's one question. How do we handle conditional statements in a data flow structure? So we covered this. If you remember, there were conditional nodes in a data flow graph uh, and also uh, uh, Boolean uh, nodes that, uh, that generate conditions or predicates, if you will. Uh, if you go to uh, lecture 11, uh, I showed you how to actually do the conditional statements. Uh, so essentially, conditional statements uh, become data uh, statements, data flow graph nodes. Uh, okay, uh, I think there's one more question, which is how does the machine decide which instruction to execute if both become ready in the same cycle, but there's only one available function yet? So we covered this in yesterday's lecture a little bit, but basically uh, there should be a policy. If, if multiple instructions are ready and you don't have enough execution units to actually uh, uh, execute them concurrently, uh, then you need to make a decision. And there, there are hardware arbiters that decide which one to prioritize. Usually oldest first is a safe prioritization mechanism, but people have studied different policies and I'm not going to go into those policies. Okay, too much parallelism, high bookkeeping overhead, high hardware overhead. There are also other issues like how to enable mutable data structures, data structures th that change a lot, databases, large data structures that you keep writing to. These actually become problems in data flow because data flow at its purest sense don't have the idea of data structures also. So people have tried to incorporate those ideas of data structures, but I'm not going to go into that. And there are a lot of other issues in literature. So if you actually do data flow at the ISA level, you have to handle all of these different issues as we see over here, and they're not easy. But if you actually do data flow at the microarchitecture level, remember I actually discussed the slide also uh, in lecture 11. Uh, basically, if you do data flow at the microarchitecture level, you get rid of all of these disadvantages. Actually, essentially, you get rid of all of these disadvantages or actually scale them down to a smaller level. Certainly, you get rid of the precise exception uh, disadvantage. You get rid of the too much parallelism uh, disadvantage. You get rid of high hardware overhead, but the hardware overhead is still uh, large. And you get rid of the how to enable mutable data structures because you're not changing the programming model. Right? If so, if you do it at the microarchitecture level without exposing anything to the programmer, then you're golden, if you will, because you actually get some of the benefits of data flow. And that's why out of order execution has been extremely successful as we have mentioned yesterday. So there's one more question. Can we do the branch prediction, value prediction, and data flow? That's a great question actually. And uh, people have actually looked at it and uh, people actually uh, uh, figured out that that's a limitation of a data flow engine because you don't have the predicates of conditional nodes ready early on. And people looked at incorporating branch prediction and I believe value prediction also into data flow machines, but there are no machines that are implemented that way. But uh, that's part of the research in data flow, which is not happening a whole lot uh, today, as I mentioned. But that's a very good question. Certainly, you can combine the idea of branch prediction uh, with data flow because you want to get the, uh, if you want to execute some part of your data flow chain faster, quicker, you may want to predict values and predict uh, branches, right? Okay, so this slide, as I said, uh, uh, you can, you can make the trade-off at the microarchitecture level. And as we said in lecture 11, microarchitecture can execute instructions in any order as long as programmer sees the order specified by the ISA. And that's what the out of order execution is. Okay, so that, uh, I'm not going to talk more about uh, data flow. And there are a lot of good questions and you guys are thinking uh, nicely, I think. You all are thinking nicely. If you're interested in this more, 
Uh, these are some seminal papers on data flow. Uh, it was introduced by uh, Dennis and Misunas in the seminal paper in 1974. And later, there's been a lot of work, a lot of machines built, uh, but I don't have uh, time or, uh, to actually write them on this slide. But if you're really interested, I would recommend watching this lecture, uh, which goes into a lot of detail. For example, you, it goes into detail of how do you do loops and function calls and data flow, which are also interesting because you need to provide mechanisms for doing that in data flow graphs. So you can actually build a full machine uh, as a complete data flow graph, where the operating system and the programs are also integrated with each other through, through uh, special data flow nodes uh, uh, that act as gates, for example. But again, uh, that's uh, a completely different lecture that, than uh, what we have time for uh, in this particular class. And I'd recommend you take a look at uh, earlier uh, these lectures if you're really interested in this. Okay, so that brings me to the end of data flow and out order execution. Now let's talk about a completely orthogonal concept, uh, superscalar execution. Mm. And this concept is very easy, actually. Uh, and you, we actually briefly discussed it uh, earlier. Uh, but let me give you the idea. I think uh, the idea is very simple, as I said. You, instead of fetching, decoding, executing, retiring one instruction per cycle, you fetch, decode, execute, retire multiple instructions per cycle. Sounds easy, right? So this is called superscalar because uh, doing uh, fetching decoding, executing, retiring one instruction per cycle is called scalar execution. You, you operate on a scalar value, if you will, if you stretch the analogy. Superscalar means uh, multiple of these scalar instructions that are executed concurrently, okay? And we're this is still a von Neumann model concept, but again, conceptually, it could be applied to other models as well. So n white superscalar means, for example, you fetch, decode, execute, retire, n instructions per cycle. Basically, your pipeline, is not one instruction white, but it's actually n instructions white. Okay, so it's not so existing pipelines actually existing processors are usually uh, more than four instructions per cycle. They're fetching more than four instructions per cycle. Some of them are fetching eight instructions per cycle, and people are trying to increase it so that you can get more concurrency. For example, so of course to be able to do this, you need to add the hardware resources for doing so. You need to replicate the pipeline resources so that you can execute, you can fetch, decode, execute, and retire multiple instructions. And on top of this, you need to extend the hardware dependence ch uh, checking logic to concurrently fetch instructions. So if you think about the hardware dependence check checking logic, we have it across different pipeline stages, right? Uh, that's what that's what we developed in the pipelining lectures. Now you need to have it within a pipeline stage across different instructions so that the younger instructions that you fetched in the same cycle uh, uh, determine their dependencies correctly because they may be dependent on an instruction that you fetched in the same cycle, right? An earlier instruction. And you need to detect that and you need to ensure that the pipeline works correctly in the presence of multiple instruction fetch. So superscalar execution is also, is an example of multiple instruction fetch. Uh, so in order to be able to decode multiple instructions, you need to be able to fetch multiple instructions, right? Uh, certainly, that's how your performance improves. Uh, uh, because if you can fetch only one instruction, you can retire only one instruction, right? That's, uh, that's, that's really important. This is called Flynn's bottleneck. Uh, basically, if you want to finish more than one instruction, you need to fetch more than one instruction. Internally, out of order execution, as we discussed last time, executes multiple instructions concurrently, can dispatch multiple instructions concurrently, but the machine we saw was able to fetch only one instruction and retire one instruction. So at cycles per instruction, it was fundamentally limited to one, uh, one in that case, right? Uh, but, uh, well, instructions per cycle, let's say, because we're, we're talking about throughput, right? Uh, but uh, superscale execution enables instruction per cycle to be greater than one, if you will. But uh, again, you need to pay the hardware cost, as we discussed. Hardware needs to perform dependence checking between concurrently fetched instructions. And if you're doing the superscalar execution in an out of order machine, you need to do the renaming concurrently as well, right? Okay, uh, I should mention this because many uh, works, including the paper that I recommended to you to read, uh, confuses, unfortunately, these concepts a little bit in the title, for example, that the paper does. Essentially, superscalar execution and out of order execution are completely orthogonal concepts. You can have an out of order machine that's scalar. That was the machine we simulated yesterday, right? We were fetching one instruction per cycle. But internally, we had multiple executions. We could execute more than one instruction per cycle. We could complete more than one instruction per cycle, but we could not retire more than one instruction per cycle. But again, you're bottleneck by fetch. If you fetch one instruction per cycle, you cannot retire more than one instruction per cycle unless you're doing some magic in the back end of the pipeline. 
so you can have an out-of-order execution that's super scalar. You can have in-order execution that's super scalar also, right? Basically, you, if, if, if you have two dimensions, in-order versus out-of-order execution and scalar versus super scalar execution, you can have four combinations, uh, the Cartesian product of these different uh, dimensions, essentially. Uh, uh, for example, you can have an in-order scalar machine. We've seen that in the basic pipeline machine. Out-of-order scalar machine. We've seen that in the basic uh, out-of-order machine we studied yesterday. I'm going to show you an in-order super scalar machine right now. And you can imagine an out-of-order super scalar machine easily. And existing processors are all out-of-order super, existing high-performance processors are all out-of-order super scalar processors. Okay, so this is the example of in-order super scalar processor from your book, actually. Uh, your book dedicates very little uh, space for super scalar execution, but the conceptually it's easy as you can see. But basically you have multiple copies of the data path so that you can fetch, decode, execute, retire multiple instructions per cycle. And you can see it here. Basically uh, you need to widen your instruction memory output so that you can read multiple instructions per cycle. And then you need to have more ports to your register file or you somehow need to replicate your register file. I'm not going to go into the details of it uh, so that you can read uh, two source registers per instruction. Here we have two, uh, we can fetch two instructions per cycle. We can decode two instructions per cycle, read in, from the register file two instructions per cycle. You can also see that we, can, we are writing to the register file two instructions per cycle. We have two ALUs, as you can see, so that we can execute two instructions per cycle. And then uh, if two instructions happen to be memory accesses, you need to have two read ports to the memory or two write ports to the memory so that you can read uh, two instructions per cycle and write two instructions per cycle into memory, load, loads and stores essentially, right? And eventually the write back stage also should handle, should be able to handle two instructions per cycle, as you can see, as we briefly mentioned. So basically you need to replicate your resources so that you can handle two instructions per cycle, but that's not enough. Uh, here, ideal IPC is two, of course, right? In this case. So basically you've doubled your IPC ideally. If these instructions are completely independent of each other, that's great. By not necessarily fully doubling the resources, you're getting double the performance potentially. Well, performance is a different issue. You're doubling the IPC instructions per cycle. We will see about performance in a little bit, actually. But dependencies make it tricky, of course, right? To dispatch multiple instructions in the same cycle. Basically, after you figure out which registers each instruction is sourcing, you need to check whether the older, uh, younger instruction is sourcing a register written by the older instruction. And load store dependencies also become problematic, right? You may have a store in, uh, as the second instruction, younger instruction, and a load, well, the other way around. You may have a load as the younger instruction, you may have a store as the older instruction, and they may have the same address, but you don't know it until you compute both of their addresses. So you need to be able to check uh, the dependencies of multiple instructions that are concurrently fetched in the same cycle, in addition to checking the dependencies of the instruction that you're uh, decoding with all other instructions that are already in the pipeline. So basically, uh, this uh, makes uh, your dependency checking logic, logic more complex, as we have discussed. And you can imagine if you have a 16 wide fetch engine, uh, if you can fetch 16 instructions, then every single instruction uh, should really check the dependencies, uh, uh, should really check if it's really sourcing a register uh, that is written by an earlier instruction within that 16 instruction bundle, if you will. And that makes the dependency checking logic actually look like kind of a tree, if you will. Uh, you can imagine that. I'm not going to go into the details of it. But fundamentally, it's no different from checking the dependencies between different pipeline stages, except you're doing it concurrently right now. But the downside is if you do it concurrently, it may impact your cycle time, right? Okay, well, even the earlier dependency checking could impact your cycle time as we discussed. Okay, so let's take a look at the performance of an in-order superscalar machine that I showed you earlier uh, in this slide. If you look at this code, all of the instructions are independent of each other, which is great. As a result, you get the ideal IPC. You can issue six instructions in three cycles in this particular case over here. So that's good. That's, uh, that's how uh, things work. Uh, that, that, that's how you get the performance. So there's one question. This is essentially multi-threading, right? No, uh, this is different from multi-threading. Here, you're fetching from the same thread. So this is the same thread of execution, you can see. This is the same program, basically. Multi-threading, you're fetching from different threads every cycle. So uh, you could have a superscalar machine where you're fetching from, uh, where the instructions that you fetch uh, in the same cycle are from different threads. 
So certainly you can combine the idea of superscalar with multi-threading. But that's not what I did over here. Basically, I'm fetching PC, instruction at PC over here, and the instruction at PC plus four. So I'm fetching two consecutive instructions from uh, the same program. Okay? But good question in the sense that you can combine those concepts also. You can have superscalar processor where each instruction that is, uh, is, is fetched from different threads. But superscalar normally refers to a single program and you fetch multiple instructions in the same cycle from that program. Okay, so this is an e easy and nice example, beautiful example, if you will, where uh, the instructions happen to be independent of each other. As a result, uh, there are no dependencies between concurrently fetched instructions. As a result, you get the full throughput of a superscalar machine, two instructions per cycle, and that's great. You've doubled the performance, hopefully, assuming you didn't do anything badly to your clock cycle time by building this superscalar processor. Now, how do you get this? Of course, your compiler can be intelligent, right? If you have an in-order superscalar machine, your compiler can, again, reorder the instructions such that uh, any two consecutive instructions are independent of each other, right? If you can do that, again, your, uh, your compiler has provided you two independent instructions. And this is one place where compilers can be very useful. Even in out-of-order superscalar machines, compilers can be useful by packing uh, independent instructions uh, so that they can be fetched concurrently and they can be dispatched concurrently into the machine. Okay, life is not always this beautiful as we have discussed with pipelining. That's true for superscalar performance also. Let's take a look at this particular program. Here you can see that load word is loading T0 and add is sourcing T0. Too bad. These two instructions are dependent. Well, add is dependent on load word. And that's true for sub also. Uh, this and is dependent on sub. And that's true for uh, this or and store word also, as you can see. Now, because this happened, we've lost one slot, if you will. Uh, we could dispatch load word over here, but we cannot dispatch the next add. As a result, uh, we're not utilizing the superscalar white pipeline nicely. As a result, the instruction per cycle actually goes down to 1.2. We're issuing six instructions in five cycles over here. Of course, it's a cooked up, a cooked up example. Uh, but now you can potentially see uh, how the compiler can do the reordering. Right? Potentially, the compiler can take the sub-instruction and reorder it over here and take this OR instruction and reorder it over here. And if it does that, then you're back to being golden, if you will. I didn't really verify it exactly, but I believe I didn't violate any dependencies by doing that. You take the sub-instruction, reorder it before the add, and you take this, uh, well, that may not work because you have the T0 over here. So you need to rename T0 also. There you go. So basically, the, you're running issues with compiler reordering. Maybe you cannot do it just by looking at this piece of code. You may need to look at later parts of the code to actually do that reordering. But if the compiler can actually put instructions over here that are independent, you can get back to ideal IPC, assuming the compiler is uh, able to do that, of course, right? OK. Uh, so what happens if concurrently fetched instructions write to the same register as superscalar machine? Can it remember which was first? Yes, you, need, you do need to remember, right? Again, uh, because of the sequential semantics of the von Neumann model, you cannot write uh, to the same register in an out-of-order manner. You need to obey that false dependency. Even though it's a false dependency, you still need to obey it due to sequential execution semantics because uh, what might happen, as you know, is an exception, right? And in an exceptional condition, you really want to be able to figure out what was going on. So yes, the superscalar machine needs to deal with those dependencies as well, just like a pipeline machine does. But superscalar, things become a little bit more complicated. So that's a very good question, actually. OK, uh, OK, um, OK, review. Uh, remember that uh, we discussed many ways of handling data dependencies in earlier lectures. And all of these are actually applicable to superscalar machines as well. Right? I'm not going to go into it. Certainly, you can do fine-grained multi-threading, as we discussed. You can do value prediction. You can do out of order execution plus superscalar. You can try to detect and eliminate the dependence at the software level, like we discussed. Software can do scheduling. And you, it, at the very basics, you need to detect and wait. Uh, or the software ensures that uh, you, you never need to stall by inserting no ops, for example, right? As we discussed. And you still can have forwarding bypassing as well within concurrent instructions. But uh, that's not easy to do, as you can imagine. So, certainly, all of these are applicable to superscalar machines as well. So, that's why they're fundamental. So let's discuss the trade-offs of superscalar execution uh, before we conclude this part of the lecture. Certainly a big disadvantage, uh, the, the main reason why we're doing this is we, we want to get higher concurrence, higher instruction throughput, and essentially higher IPC, instructions per cycle. Uh, 
Instructions per cycle is the inverse of CPI, which we are trying to reduce, as you remember, right? As we, as I will show you in a little bit. Basically, lower CPI is good. So execution time of an entire program is number of instructions times the average CPI times the clock cycle time. Basically, we're reducing the average CPI, hopefully, uh, by doing super scare execution. We're not changing the number of instructions because the same instruction stream is executing. Assume that the compiler produces the same instruction stream. And that's the idea in super scary execution as much as possible. Then the question becomes, are we changing the clock cycle time, right? If we're not changing the clock cycle time, that's good always, right? We're reducing the CPI and we should be improving performance. But possibly we may be changing the clock cycle time because of some of these disadvantages over here, which we've already discussed actually. Essentially, we have higher complexity for dependence checking right now. It requires checking within a pipeline stage, which was not required in any of the machines that we discussed earlier. And register renaming becomes more complex in an out of order processor, especially if you want to build a wide super scalar engine, eight wide, let's say, eight instructions per cycle. And in many machines today, you can fetch eight instructions per cycle, decode eight instructions per cycle, and rename eight instructions per cycle. But you need to check dependencies uh, within, those, uh, within that bundle of eight instructions. And you need to do the renaming also concurrently at the same time. Because if remember, we discussed renaming yesterday for a scalar machine. And whenever you do renaming, you need to read your sources from the register alias table. Uh, and then you need to also uh, uh, write uh, to your destination register the new name, meaning the reservation station ID or the reorder buffer ID, or essentially the physical register ID. Right? Basically, you need to be able to do that for all eight instructions concurrently while obeying the dependencies between those eight instructions. So this becomes a sequential process, right? Because a later instruction, Let's say uh, you're fetching instructions zero through seven. Instruction seven can be dependent on six. Instruction six can be dependent on instruction five. Instruction five can be dependent on instruction four. Instruction four can be dependent on instruction three, which can be dependent on instruction two, which can be dependent on instruction one, which can be dependent on instruction zero. Now, if all of them are dependent, then you need to propagate the correct uh, names or tags to each of those instructions through a serial dependence chain. And you need to do that within a cycle, or at least concurrently. Again, you don't necessarily need to do it within a cycle. You can break that pipeline stage into many cycles, right? But that increases the depth of your pipeline and hence your branch misprediction penalty, which is important as we will see in the next lecture. So basically this becomes complicated and it can potentially increase your clock cycle time if you're not able to break uh, the, uh, this dependence checking logic into multiple pipeline stages successfully. If you do break it into multiple pipeline stages, then it can affect your instruction throughput worse, right? Basically, you increase your instruction throughput by uh, adding super scale execution. But dependency checking within a single cycle was not good for clock cycle time. So you did it in multiple clock cycles, which means that you increase the depth of your pipeline. Whenever you increase the depth of your pipeline, your CPI cycles per instruction gets impacted negatively, meaning it increases because of branch misprediction delay that increases. And also because now you need to keep the pipeline full, right? The deeper your pipeline is, the more difficult to keep pipeline full because you have data dependencies. Okay, so you can see that there's complicated trade-offs once you go into uh, multiple instruction fetch pipeline machines. And also registry naming is not easy. Okay, uh, and, and clearly, as I said, this potentially lengthens the critical path delay and clock cycle time. So uh, Disadvantage can actually reduce the performance uh, gains that are achieved uh, by increasing the instruction throughput. Okay, and of course, uh, obviously more hardware resources are needed. You need to replicate the pipeline, at least parts of it, so that you can fetch, decode, execute, uh, and retire multiple instructions per cycle. Okay, so that brings us uh, nicely to the end of lecture 17a. And uh, unless there are burning questions, it's a really good time to take a break. And I will take a break for 10 minutes. We can be back at 15.10. And then we will continue or we will start uh, the branch prediction uh, lecture. OK, is there a question? Feel free to write. Uh, I don't see it. OK, maybe we'll take the break. And feel free to write it over the break. Uh, and then we can handle it when we come back from the break.
Okay, let's get started with the second part of the lecture. Uh, we're going to switch to a branch prediction, which we have briefly covered in an earlier lecture when we discussed pipelining and de dependencies and control dependence as a form of data, uh, as a special form of data dependence. Now we're going to go into branch prediction in a little bit uh, more deeply because it's it's been a fascinating topic and it's been one of the enablers of why uh, these pipeline machines have been extremely successful because uh, branch prediction and good branch prediction algorithms that have been developed over the course of decades have enabled uh, uh, people to keep the pipeline full uh, and moving as much as possible. Uh, and uh, for this, I would recommend uh, reading the Combining Branch Predictors uh, technical report, which has been quite influential in the field. And it's a very nicely written report describing some branch predictors that we're going to talk about. Uh, but this topic is also covered uh, in the microarchitecture of superscalar processors uh, reading that you're doing. OK, so this is uh, what we covered. Uh, we, are st we have started other execution paradigms. And uh, just now, we have covered data flow and superscalar execution. Uh, we're going to cover more paradigms, but uh, it's important to cover control dependence handling, uh, branch prediction before we move on, because branch prediction is extremely instrumental uh, for uh, things, many things we have seen, or control dependence handling is very instrumental to uh, things we have seen. And it's going to be very instrumental for other, other things we're going to see also. So we're going to talk about briefly branch prediction when we talk about BLIW, decoupled access execute, SIMD processing, we're going to talk how to handle branches over there. Uh, anyone's systolic arrays require and decision-making, basically. So keep that in mind. Control dependencies are quite fundamental uh, in the end. They exist in data flow machines also, as we have discussed, except uh, they are uh, converted to data dependencies. Uh, but if you can execute them faster, uh, then they could enable you to uh, be uh, faster in a data flow machine. But maybe they're not as disruptive uh, to a data flow machine. OK, so control dependence, remember the slide. Uh, we covered this also briefly. Uh, well, we covered it, actually. Basically, the basic question we're trying to answer is, what should the fetch PC be in the next cycle in a pipeline processor? And the obvious answer is the address of the next instruction to be fetched, right? But how do you know that? Because uh, your all instructions are actually control dependent on previous ones because of sequential execution, because of pro uh, dependence on the program counter, right? I every instruction uh, changes the program counter. Now, some of them trivially change the program counter. They increment the program counter or change the uh, program counter by the size of the instruction. If you, don't, if you don't have fixed size instructions, that becomes a problem as well in branch prediction or control dependence handling if you don't have fixed size instructions. But the real problem happens when you have control flow changing, sequence changing instructions like branches, uh, conditional branches. So if the fetch instruction is not a control flow instruction, then the next fetch PC is the address of the next sequential instruction. And if it's PC plus four, for example, like in MIPS uh, and many other ISAs, then you can safely increment the PC. And that's what we have done so far, right? Incremented the PC and assume that it's good. If it's not a good decision or a good prediction, let's say, then you figure that out when the branch is resolved and you flush the pipeline. And we have seen that already. Of course, this is easy to do. If you know the size of the fetched instruction, you increment the uh, program counter by the size of the fetched instruction without having to decode it. But if you do not know the size of the fetched instruction, which happens in variable length instruction set ISAs, x86 is one example uh, where instructions can range anywhere from one byte to 16 bytes, 17 bytes, I think right now, actually, don't quote me on it, but they've also been changing the ISA, evolving it over time. But certainly anywhere between one to 15 plus bytes, let's say. And you determine the size of the instruction after you decode the instruction. Basically, you don't know the size of the instruction before you decode it, which means that the fetch stage you don't know what to fetch, basically. You can guess, of course, the size of the instruction. And that's what a lot of x86 processors actually do today. They guess the size of the instruction. OK, so this becomes a problem even when uh, uh, the control flow, uh, the fetched instruction is not a control flow instruction if your ISA is not nice so that you don't know, uh, uh, such that you don't know uh, the uh, size of your instruction. But of course, it's a bigger problem if the instruction that's fetched is a control flow instruction because you haven't even executed the instruction. You don't know whether it will be a taken branch if it's a conditional branch. And how do you determine the next fetch PC? You need the next fetch PC the next cycle immediately, right? It's not like you don't you have a lot of time to determine it. You need it at the end of the cycle so that you can have the full next cycle so that uh, you can access the instruction memory with the next fetch PC. 
I mean, we don't even know whether the uh, fetched instruction is a control flow instruction. So we cannot even distinguish between those two cases because we have not decoded the instruction yet. The instruction is being fetched at the moment in the fetch stage. So a control dependence, that's why it's, very, it's so disruptive uh, to a pipeline processor because at the beginning of the pipeline, it immediately poses you a problem. What are you going to fetch next? And we're going to handle this basically in the next couple of uh, the, today and uh, in the next lecture. And uh, it's important to remember that there are many branch types in, uh, in an ISA. And these are some examples. Uh, there are conditional branches, unconditional branches, calls, returns, and indirect branches. And, uh, and ISA actually have many more combinations, if you will. And different branch types can be handled differently, just like we designed different data path elements to handle different branches. The J instruction, MIPS jump instruction was different from uh, the BEQ, for example, a branch equal. A branch equal is a conditional branch. Direction at fetch time is unknown. And that's a problem, basically. You don't know whether you should be taken or you should be going to the taken path or not taken path. And there are two possible next fetch addresses. And the next fetch address is resolved at the execution stage. So this is register dependent, usually, right? Uh, depending on the addressing mode, of course, but the tough ones are register dependent. And these are the ones that we're going to deal with a lot in this lecture. Other uh, branches also cause problems, like un unconditional branches are always taken. Uh, there's only one possible target address, as you know. And you can resolve the fetch address at the decode stage early, as we have discussed earlier, uh, with some trade-offs. Uh, but you still, need to, you still need to have a bubble in the fetch stage, right? Because you don't know the target address until you decode the instruction. So this leads to a bubble. Call instructions are similar. Uh, they're always taken and you can resolve them at decode, but uh, again, uh, they, they can lead to a bubble. Return instructions are also similar, except the number of possible fetch addresses or returns can be many because you may have many different call sites calling the same function, right, in a program. And you need to be able to return to the real callee uh, or, or real caller. Basically, that's why uh, 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 we save uh, the address of the instruction after the call onto the stack such that the return instruction can pop it and return back to it uh, by jumping to that register, right? Jumping to the address in that register. So you can actually optimize calls and returns. If your program is nice, uh, you can have, uh, you can push the address after the call onto a hardware structure called return address stack. And whenever you see a return instruction, you can pop the uh, target address in the hardware structure and use that as your next fetch PC, right? Now, if you have the stack and the stack is nice, meaning calls and returns are always balanced in your program. The programmer was nice such that uh, they always call, 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 and then return, return, return. And the nesting level was always correct, et cetera. Then this hardware structure called return address stack can be extremely useful and extremely accurate in real processors actually. Real processors use these called return stacks or return address stacks. It's also called CRS, called return stack. But basic idea is whenever you fetch a call, execute a call instruction, you put, put, um, uh, push the target address, push the address of the next instruction on the stack. And then whenever you execute the return instruction uh, or whenever you fetch the return instruction, you pop it from the stack. Of course, this needs to be done in order, in program order. I'm not going to get into how to do that. I have some backup slides, which we probably will not, are not going to cover even in the next lecture. But I wanted to give you this idea that calls and returns can be handled more easily if you assume that a program does call and then return, and, and there's always a matching return, right? Okay, indirect uh, branches are tough. They're always taken, but they have many possible next fetch addresses. B basically, indirect branches jumping to uh, a location specified by a register, right? And that location could be anything. This could be useful for implementing virtual function calls, for example. I'm not going to go into the details of it unless we have time at the end of the next lecture. Uh, but these are actually tough uh, uh, branches to predict because there could be many possible target addresses and you don't know the target address until execution. So indirect branches and, uncon and conditional branches are the most difficult branches in a machine in general. Uh, usually in ISAs, you don't have conditional indirect branches. If you had a combination of conditional indirect, then uh, uh, it's not always taken, and even the direction would be unknown over here, right? But usually, you don't have that in uh, existing uh, ISAs that we have. But we're going to tackle the conditional branches mainly uh, in, uh, in this lecture. And we, if we have time at the end of next lecture, we may cover some of these other ones. I've already given you the basic idea of a return address stack, uh, which you can think about uh, a little bit. 
But if this is to show you that different branch types can be handled differently, and they have to be handled differently. Other, if you try to handle them using, a same, using the same mechanism in your pipeline, then you're probably penalizing yourself because the same mechanism dictates that you handle the worst case again. And worst case could be indirect or conditional or conditional indirect together if you have, if you have that. Uh, but you can easily handle unconditional branches, as I said, and you can relatively easily handle call and return instructions as well. Okay, so basically uh, it's critical to keep the pipeline full with the correct sequence of dynamic instructions. And this is no news to you. Uh, and there are multiple potential solutions if the instruction is a control flow instruction. You can stall the pipeline until you know the next fetch address, bad idea. We've discussed this briefly. I'm going to discuss very briefly again and dismiss it. You can guess the next fetch address, branch prediction. And we've done it actually, as we discussed earlier. We've predicted the branch as not taken in our earlier lectures about pipelining. We're going to do better in this lecture, basically. Can we do better than not taken prediction? But we're going to also cover some basics of branch prediction before we get there. You can employ delayed branching, branch delay slot, which MIPS employs. I'm going to talk about this after uh, in the next lecture sometime, hopefully. But this is in general a bad idea because basically, uh, this basically says that branch takes effect after N cycles or after N instructions. And it's the compiler's job or the programmer's job to fill those N cycles with independent instructions. Now you're basically putting a lot of burden on the programmer and the compiler. And worse yet, somehow, needs to, somehow you, somebody needs to decide this N. How many cycles? Now that becomes extremely problematic because branch misprediction penalty is really a function of the pipeline depth. And pipeline is fundamentally a function of microarchitecture. We don't want to expose it to the ISA. But if you have a, something like a branch delay slot, if you change the semantics of the branch instruction such that it requires information from the microarchitecture, now you're, what you're doing in the ISA is not very clean, if you will. And this has caused a lot of problems. Actually, MIPS, uh, because of its philosophy, it employed delayed branching. It has a single cycle branch delay slot. It assumes that the branch will be resolved in the second uh, stage of the pipeline, which is not a good assumption, clearly, in existing pipelines, especially out of order execution pipelines. So now uh, people are stuck with it, basically. So it doesn't buy you anything. It just uh, gives you a lot of hurdle in code generation and also implementation in hardware as well. Do something else, fine grain multi threading. We already covered this uh, in its own part of a lecture. Uh, related to pipelining, as you remember. Certainly fine-grained multi-threading gets rid of the control flow dependencies within a thread uh, and well, uh, because by, by fetching instructions across different threads. So you don't need to uh, predict branches at all because you're not filling the pipeline with instructions from the same thread anyway. And clearly this is nice, but we already covered the trade-offs. You can eliminate control flow instructions of using multiple methods. I'm hopefully going to cover that briefly today, but if we have, if, we have, if time permits, we're going to talk about that next week uh, also. This is called predicate execution. This is basically the idea of converting control flow instructions to data flow, uh, data uh, dependencies. Control, and you can do that, right? You, you, you know the model of data flow right now. Data flow doesn't have branches. Data flow has these nodes that basically make decisions, decision-making nodes, or called conditional nodes in lecture 11. So clearly you can convert branches into data flow nodes. And that's essentially this idea over here, predicate execution. The compiler does it. Hardware can potentially do it with additional cost. And if you do that, you can eliminate the problem, but now you turn the problem to a data dependency problem, right? And we'll hopefully cover this briefly. This is an idea that was employed in some ISAs like IS64 and ARM. And the last idea is fetch from, okay, whenever you get to a branch, you, have, you get to a fork, Take both paths, right? Of course, this requires you to have more hardware and you, know, you to know the addresses of both possible paths. Assume that you figure that out and we're gonna see how to figure that out potentially. This is called multi-path execution. This is a hardware intensive solution and potentially it could be useful if you do it as a last resort, if your branch prediction is not good, for example, et cetera. And we will briefly talk about it maybe at the end of next lecture. But I wanted to give you the high level idea of these six different potential solutions for uh, handling control dependencies in general and branches in particular. Okay, now let's take a look at the stall the pipeline solution and dismiss it quickly. We've already seen kind of last time, but basically you have a branch instruction. Do you want to stall the fetch until next PC is known? Is that a good idea? Not a good idea. Even if you have an unconditional branch instruction, which gets resolved in the decode stage, you cannot fetch the next instruction, right? Basically, that becomes a bubble. 
the branch results. Uh, well, uh, basically, uh, this is it's a, it's a non-control flow instruction. Even non-control flow instruction, basically, we're looking at. You know, you're not doing any prediction, basically. But unconditional branch instructions, uh, also, you can assume that they're being resolved in the decode stage, right? Basically, you at least need to decode the instruction. And if it's a non-control flow instruction, you know that the next PC should be PC plus four, but you can also only fetch it in the next cycle, right? And that's true for unconditional branch instruction. You calculate the next PC in this decode uh, stage and then uh, feed it to the program counter. And you can only fetch the next instruction in the next cycle. Basically, if you, for non-control flow and unconditional branch instructions, if you wait until the next PC is truly known, you're wasting half of your pipeline throughput because only every other cycle you're fetching a useful instruction. So clearly, this is a very bad idea. You should, you should do at least some prediction. And the safest prediction, as we discussed, easiest prediction, not necessarily the safest prediction, easiest prediction is predict that next PC will be the sequential uh, PC after the previous instruction, PC plus four, basically. And we have seen it also. So that's why stalling is a bad idea uh, in general. OK, so we've seen do something else. I'm not going to go through that. So I will eliminate that solution. If you're interested, you can look at the pipelining lecture again, study it again. But fine grade multi-threading is a very powerful idea, clearly. This is how. Uh, GPUs ensure that they don't need to de do branch prediction within a thread. Right? Now we're going to focus on the solution of guessing the next fetch address. We already know the solution, but now we're going to design better algorithms. And this has fascinated people over the course of 40 years or so. And it's, just, it's really amazing what people have built into branch prediction hardware. There, there is, of course, more work to be done. Uh, but today we're getting into accuracies like 96%, 98%. In some cases, 99% accuracy in terms of the prediction of the branch. Uh, but we will see that that may not be enough if you keep building bigger and bigger and wider and wider machines. OK, let's take a look at this problem, basically. So the problem is control flow instructions, branches are frequent. They could be anywhere between 15 to 20 25% of all instructions in general purpose programs. Uh, the problem is next fetch address after control flow instruction is not determined after n cycles in a pipeline processor. And n cycle is really the branch misprediction penalty. or minimum branch resolution latency, essentially. Uh, I say minimum over here because in an out-of-order machine, this could be longer, right? If the branches depend on a long latency load operation, then it may actually wait for hundreds of cycles, maybe thousands of cycles potentially in the machine without being resolved. Okay, keep that in mind. In out-of-order execution, uh, whenever you have dependencies uh, to long latency instructions, even in in-order execution, this happens, of course, but out-of-order execution amplifies the problem because you have many more instructions in the machine. Then you may actually be waiting in the machine for a long time uh, for a branch that is not resolved yet. So, okay, if we're fetching W instructions per cycle, in other words, if the pipeline is W wide, this is really the superscalar width. We're assuming a superscalar machine. A branch misprediction leads to N times W wasted instruction slots because you're waiting for n cycles at least. And each cycle, you, you're, you are supposed to fetch W instructions. You're wasting those opportunities. n times W instruction slots are wasted. And this is really the branch misprediction penalty in a superscalar machine. In a scalar machine, it's n cycles minimum. In a superscalar machine, it's n, n, n times W wasted instruction slots at minimum. Now let's take a look at the importance of the branch problem by doing an exercise. Assume that we have 20 pipeline stages, which is reasonable in today's standards. Uh, N is 20, basically. Branches resolved after 20 cycles. And uh, W is 5. We're doing 5 wide fetch. I picked that number so that we can ease the calculations a little bit. Assume 1 out of 5 instructions is a branch. OK? And assume each 5 instruction block ends with a branch regularly. How long does it take to fetch 500 instructions? So there are multiple ways of approaching this problem. I will let you find your own approach. In general, that's my approach. It's best for you to find your own approach to approach the problems. But let me give you how I would approach this problem, basically. Uh, so I'm asked, uh, of course, the question is not complete yet. How long does it take to fetch 500 instructions? I cannot just ask you that. I should give you the accuracy of the branch prediction. Right? If the branch prediction is 100% accurate. OK. So if the branch prediction is 100% accurate, I have 500 instructions. I don't care about the branch, right? Because it's always accurate branch prediction. I don't have any delay, if you will. So basically, I'm fetching five instructions per cycle, and I have 500 instructions, meaning that I should be able to fetch all of them in 100 cycles. Because all instructions that I fetch are on the correct path, right? OK, so this is easy, hopefully. 
I have five instructions, five instructions per cycle. Branches don't impose any penalty because I'm 100% accurate. And I'm fetching five instructions per cycle. So I have 500 divided by five, 100 cycles. OK, so there's no wasted work. IPC is perfectly five, assuming no data dependencies, of course. I'm assuming that also. Uh, that was not written over here. OK, so this is great. Now let's go to 99% accuracy. So basically, this says that I have one out of 100 branches mispredicted. I'm fetching 500 instructions. One out of five instructions a branch. So I have 100 branches here, which means that I have one branch mispredicted. Among those five inst 500 instructions, I have one misprediction. OK? So how do I approach the problem? Basically, I still need to fetch all of the correct path instructions. I cannot get away from that. In the end, I have to fetch from the correct path. So I need to spend 100 cycles fetching the correct path instructions. I have one, is one branch mispredicted. For that one mispredicted branch, I spent 20 cycles on the wrong path. OK? So basically, I waste those 20 cycles. Right? So my program now takes 120 cycles to fetch. So that's the calculation. So hopefully that's clear, because only one branch is mispredicted, right? OK. Uh, OK. Uh, so basically, you fetch 20% extra instructions in this case, because uh, uh, remember that uh, 20 cycles you're spending on the wrong path, 100 cycles you're spending on the correct path. So your IPC becomes, fetch IPC at least, 500 divided by 120. OK, let's go to 90% accuracy. 99% is a lot, actually. Very good. If you go to 90%, the problem becomes worse. So 90% means 10 of those branches is mispredicted. So I have 100 branches, 90% accuracy, meaning 10% misprediction rate, 10 of those branches mispredicted. I still need to fetch 500 psych instructions. To be able to fetch 500 instructions, uh, I need uh, to spend 100 cycles on the correct path. Now I'm spending 200 cycles on the wrong path. Why? Because 10 branches are mispredicted. And each branch leads to 20 cycles wasted time on the wrong path. So now I'm spending 300 cycles to fetch 500 instructions. Now quickly it became bad, right? And I've, I've fetched 200% extra instructions. You can see from the uh, 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 ratio over here, 100%, 100 cycles are spent on the correct path, 200 cycles are on the wrong path. Now my fetch IPC is 500 divided the 300, 1.6 bar which is much worse, which is three times worse than the perfect IPC with perfect branch prediction. OK, now you can go to the exercise. If you go to 60%, you have a terrible machine because you're spending a lot of your time on the wrong path, most of your time on the wrong path, as you can see, right? Because each branch causes a 20 cycle delay, and you have 40 of those, even though your accuracy is 60%, better than random luck. Right. So this is the importance of the branch problem. You have a wide and deep pipeline. You're wasting a lot of cycles on the wrong path, even if you're 60% accurate, even if you're 90% accurate. 99% is not terrible, as you can see, but you're still wasting 20% extra instructions. Right. So that's the importance of the branch problem. And keep this in mind. We're going to do this exercise again after building some branch predictors. Uh, and it's going to be important. Uh, to look at that exercise again. OK, I would like you to convince yourself that this is correct. Uh, you can do this exercise on your own. But it's a very important exercise to understand uh, the importance of feeding the pipeline with correct instructions. OK, now let's go into branch prediction. Clearly, you know the basic idea, right? Instead of stalling the fetch, we guess the next instruction to fetch, right? So stall fetch. Uh, Essentially, so we see we have this branch instruction, blue instruction, and this is a short pipeline, uh, not a deep pipeline, as you can see. Stall fetch is a bad idea, as we discussed, because if you do that, uh, it takes a long time to refill the pipeline. Branch prediction, if you guess correctly, you keep filling the pipeline nicely. And you can do this animation on your own. We've, 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 we're past beyond this point, actually, at this point, because we already know that branch prediction is a good idea. But if you do this, you can see that we immediately gain, even in the shallow pipeline, one, two, three, four, five stages, right? We immediately gain 33% uh, performance improvement, right? OK. But of course, if you mispredict, then you need to flash the pipeline. OK. And we know that also. OK. 
So uh, what is the branch? Uh, let's talk about branch prediction algorithms. What are different algorithms to uh, do? And we've already seen this always guess next PC is equal to PC plus four. Always predict the next sequential instruct, uh, instruction is the next to be executed. This is a form of next fetch address prediction and branch prediction. It's called the not taken prediction. Basically, implicitly, you're predicting that the branch will be not taken. OK? How can you make this more effective? So assume that, uh, actually, this is not very effective. It turns out uh, its, it's prediction accuracy is 30 to 40% if you're lucky. And 30 to 40% is terrible, as we discussed, right? If you have the assumptions that we made earlier, you'd be fetching, actually, lots and lots more instructions uh, into the pipeline and wasting a lot of cycles. But uh, there are methods to make this more effective. Uh, basically, the compiler, for example, can maximize the chances that the next sequential instruction is the next instruction to be executed, potentially, right? So a software compiler or the programmer can somehow lay out the control flow graph such that the likely next instruction is on the not taken path of a branch. And this is actually a cool idea. It was, it's called Profile Guided Code Positioning. It was developed by Pettis and Hansen in PLDI 1990, if you're really interested in looking at it. And many existing compilers actually do this uh, today. Uh, uh, let me do something over here. Maybe I will uh, share my screen uh, on my iPad so that we can go over this very quickly. Uh, start broadcast. OK, we're seeing some screen over here. Now let's go to good notes over here. OK, uh, so basically, uh, uh, you have this code. Uh, let's say block A. OK, yeah, let's, let's do this. You have, let's say, if some condition, you execute block B, else uh, you execute block C, and otherwise you go to uh, the block D. And then you have block A over here. OK, uh, so this is the taken path right, in your code. And uh, this is the not taken path. Now, if your code is somehow laid out such that you have A, B, and then D, there's an unconditional jump over here. This is not good for not taken prediction, right? Why? Because to transition from A to B, the branch needs to be taken. But your processor is predicting not taken. So whenever you're transitioning from A to B, this is uh, the block B, block A, block C, block D over here. And the code is laid out sequentially like this, sequential layout. Let me do it this way. And the layout, layout is done by the compiler or the programmer. This is a bad layout for a not taken prediction because transition from the sequential block to the sequential block is not sequential. You have to have the branch to be, uh, uh, okay, maybe, maybe I, should, I, should, I should have said something else over here also, uh, basically. Uh, uh, I should have said something like uh, C is over here and, uh, uh, OK, so OK, let me, let me reconstruct this example. Sorry about that. But basically, uh, let, me, let me do the control flow graph that will make this more easy. Uh, you have the A, B, C. And then the control flow graph looks like this over here, right? And the branch is taken if you go from A to B. And it's not taken if you go this way, OK? Now, uh, let, me, let me actually draw this differently so that we're more aligned with this uh, prediction method. So I'm going to make the C. So I'm, may, I, my layout is ACD, OK? Now, ACD is nice layout uh, when the branch is not taken, right? If your prediction is not taken, uh, then uh, you're executing like this in the control flow graph, right? ACD. And your sequential instructions are ACD. You're always predicting PC equals PC plus 4. And you're always correct over here. And C is somewhere else, uh, B is somewhere else in this case. Now, this works very well. If this path is the frequently taken path, that's the important information that I was missing earlier. Basically, let's assume that A transitions to C 99.99% of the time, meaning the branch is not taken 99.99% of the time. That's good. Then this layout is great. But if you have this layout, and if the branch is taken frequently, like taken 99.99% of the time, then this layout is terrible, right? Because you're not going from A to C most of the time. In fact, you're going from A to C only 0.01% of the time. Most of the time, you need to go from A to B. 
but your code layouts are such that that's not the case. So your prediction is almost always incorrect, right? So what does the compiler do? If the compiler has this information about the control flow graph and the taken frequencies of the branches, it can lay out the code in the memory such that the taken path or the frequently executed path becomes a not taken path, right? That's the idea over here. So basically, if the compiler figures that 99.99% the branch is taken, it lays out the code such that B is here and C is here, and it somehow does the switching such that the branch works correctly, okay? That's the idea, okay? So basically, the idea is to profile the code. Let me actually fix it over here so that uh, uh, you will see what the compiler does. So basically, the compiler figures out which path is the frequently executed path and lays out the graph, uh, lays out the uh, code in the memory such that the frequently executed path is the not taken path. In this case, frequently executed path is A, uh, I should use another color perhaps, A, B, D. And you need to put B over here. And C needs to go somewhere else. And you do an unconditional jump uh, to C from this point. Uh, and I didn't uh, put all the uh, things over here. And this became a little bit messy. But that's the idea, basically. Make your frequently executed path the not taken path. OK. And the compiler do it. It can do it clearly. right? So let's go back uh, to this. And this way, the effectiveness of a not taken branch prediction becomes much better, assuming the compiler can figure out the probabilities of transitioning between different control flow blocks. Right? That requires profiling. If, if you remember one of the lectures earlier, we said compiler can get information about potential dynamic direction of the branches by profiling the code. And it requires a profile input set to be representative of the real input set. And if it's not representative, the compiler may lay out the code in one way, assuming that the frequently executed path is going to be A to B. But in real executions, if the frequently executed path goes from A to C, the compiler was wrong. And as a result, your branch prediction accuracy becomes very bad. Right? So this requires the software to lay out with some information, but the software's information may not be representative. So in, in many cases, this works nicely if your input set is representative and by, branches are biased. So this doesn't work, of course, uh, if uh, in the earlier example that I showed you, the branch is taken 50% of the time and not taken 50% of the time. Then you don't have a frequently executed path. right? You cannot maximize the chances that the next sequential instruction is the next instruction to be executed because both paths are well balanced. OK, so keep this in mind. We may get back to this actually later on. But it's a powerful idea when branches are biased. And also, a compiler can lay out the code and figure out the bias of the branches. OK, you can also do this uh, purely in hardware. I'm not going to discuss this idea right now. But hardware can do something similar. It's to profile dynamically in hardware, annotating uh, the instructions, keeping information about them, et cetera. Requires hardware cost, of course. And it can cache traces of executed instructions. So this is also a powerful idea. It was employed in Intel Pentium 4, for example. It's the trace cache idea. Uh, and if you do it well, it can work nicely. Uh, but basically, uh, let me actually go back uh, to the screen sharing. If I can uh, do this, I'll stop share. Unfortunately, I have to stop share. I don't know why. Start broadcast. Let's see if it's working. OK, it's kind of working. I'm going to use the same example that I used earlier over here. Yeah, basically, the hardware dynamically figures out, uh, because it executes the instructions like this, ABD, 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 it keeps executing ABD. If it keeps enough information about which direction branches went, the hardware can actually cache the directions of the branches. In fact, cache all of the instructions in ABD, these blocks over here, right, code blocks. And this is called the idea of a trace cache in Intel Pentium 4. It's a powerful idea that actually can feed the pipeline uh, nicely. OK, I'll stop sharing and go back uh, over here. OK. No, somehow I cannot go back. OK, share screen again. OK, uh, if you're interested, you can read the trace cache uh, ideas. OK, how else can you make P next PC equals PC plus 4 more effective? Uh, if you're always predicting 
uh, not taken. Well, uh, in general, uh, actually, how else can you make pipelines more effective? Getting rid of control flow instructions helps. This is not making just the not taken prediction more effective, but taking any uh, pipeline more effective. If you can get rid of the control flow instructions or minimize their occurrence, that's great. So how do you do that? First of all, you can combine predicates. For example, if you're testing 10 different conditions, and if you have 10 different branches uh, branching on these different conditions, well, why don't you combine those conditions and do a single branch? That way, you get rid of 10 branches, reduce it to only a single branch, and convert everything else to data dependencies. So this is called the idea of predicate combining. You test only once, you eliminate a lot of branches, and the probability of your pipeline getting flushed because of next PC equals next PC plus four reduces. Of course, data dependencies may cause a problem, but that may be easier to handle potentially, right? Okay, so this is one way. And this is software way, right? A compiler can actually produce one branch for a single combined predicate. If you're testing A, if A equals to zero and B equals to five and C greater than four, instead of having one branch for each, you have a combined predicate and a single branch. Okay, the second idea is what we briefly discussed, converting control dependence into data dependencies, predicate execution, in other words, if conversion. Again, I'm not going to go through this in this lecture, but convert the uh, control dependence into data dependence, just like in a data flow machine. So this is another example of a data flow machine uh, uh, influencing uh, control flow machines by getting rid of the control flow as much as possible, at least control flow changing instructions, I should say. Okay, so all these PC plus four, we're familiar with it. I'm not going to talk more about it basically, but instruction branch condition and target are evaluated in the ALU. And essentially when a branch resolves, uh, if you have, uh, if the target address is not matching PC plus four, or if the branch is taken and you predicted not taken, then you flush the wrong path instructions. So we discussed that you actually, you actually have a two, uh, bubble, uh, two, two instruction bubble in your pipeline. Okay, of course, this depends on how deep and wide your pipeline is, as we also discussed. This is the simple pipeline that we're building on earlier. So let's do some performance analysis. Very simple. Uh, correct guess, no penalty. Incorrect guess, two bubbles. Let's assume that our correct guess is 86% of the time. Uh, and assume that we don't have data dependency related stalls. 20% instructions are control flow instructions. 70% of control flow instructions are taken. Now, the cycles per instruction that we get in this very simple analysis, which I'm not going to go into a lot, uh, is... Uh, this. Essentially, normally, you don't have any penalty, one cycle per instruction, no data dependency related stalls. This is a simple pipeline, again. Uh, but 14% of the time, you get two cycle additional bubble, right? So your CPI becomes 1.28 as opposed to one in the single pipe, simple pipeline. We've already seen the big downside of uh, branches, so that's why I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But I would like to point out two things over here. One is the probability of our own guess. That's the branch prediction accuracy or branch misprediction rate, let's say. And the other is the penalty of our own guess, if you will. So you can actually optimize for both. Let's take a look at the penalty for our own guess. We can reduce either of the two penalty terms. And we only discuss the penalty for our own guess, basically. Reduce the branch misprediction penalty. So there are two ways we can make branches less costly. Make branch prediction better, increase our accuracy in the guess, or reduce the branch misprediction penalty. And we've already seen ways of reducing the branch misprediction penalty, right? If you remember a pipeline, we want to resolve the branch condition and target address early, as opposed to resolving it here, we resolve it here. But if you can resolve it here, that's even better potentially, right? And that was the idea over here. We basically moved the branch condition and target address resolution early to the register file stage. And if you do that, then you basically lose one instruction whenever you flush the pipeline, which is the instruction over here and your CPI becomes 1.14 in this cooked up example, but this could lengthen your clock cycle time as we have discussed earlier. You need to do register file read, comparison, and then also control the muxus and the target address calculation, which is probably not on the critical path because this may be your critical path. But basically this may or may not be a good idea. And we already discussed under which conditions this could be a good idea. If it reduces cycle per instruction much more than it lengthens the critical uh, path, then sure, it could be a good idea. But usually this uh, tends to be dangerous, especially if you put it on a critical path, uh, close to critical path logic. Okay, so let's do a little bit more enhanced branch prediction now. So ideally, uh, I mean, in general, in, if when you design a good machine, you should of course always try to reduce the branch misprediction penalty as much as possible 
but you should always be careful. In deep pipeline machines, it's hard to reduce it beyond some point. That's why we have branch misappropriation penalties that are greater than 11 cycles, 15 cycles, et cetera, uh, today. Okay, so now let's go into branch prediction in a little bit more detail. Basically, the idea is to predict the next fetch address to be used in the next cycle. This actually requires three things to be predicted at the fetch stage. You need to predict whether the fetch instruction is a branch. You need to predict the branch direction, especially important for conditional branches, of course. And you need to uh, predict the branch target address if the branch is taken. So we need different structures for this. So let's take a look at branch target address. So how do we get the branch target address immediately in the fetch stage? Um, and then we're going to look at whether the fetch instruction is a branch. And then we're going to look at the branch direction a lot in the later part of the lecture and next time. So basically, the key observation is that target address remains the same for a conditional direct branch across dynamic instances. Because target address is calculated as PC plus offset. Since PC of an instruction doesn't change, PC plus offset doesn't change. Once you calculate the target address, you can put it into a structure and remember it. That's the idea. Basically, the idea is to store the target address from a previous instance of a branch, execution of a branch, and access it by indexing it with the program counter. This is called the branch target buffer or branch target address cache. It's employed in all processors that use branch prediction. And this way, you can get the target address immediately in the fetch stage. So let's take a look at it. This is the fetch stage with BTB and branch, uh, direction prediction. So basically, you have the program counter. Uh, I'm, I don't show the instruction cache over here. While you're accessing the instruction cache or instruction memory with the program counter so that you can fetch the instruction, you're also accessing two other structures using the address of the current branch, which is the program counter. You access the cache of target addresses and also the direction predictor. We're going to study the direction predictor later. But if you, if you actually get a target address, if you actually hit in the structure, meaning the, the cache of target addresses says, oh, I have something for that program counter. I have executed that program counter before, and I've calculated the target address, and I've inserted it here. And now I can give it to you immediately. And here it is. So I'm a hit. It's a, uh, this access hits uh, in my structure. Then you can use a target address of the branch. Direction predictor tells you what to use. Basically, if the direction predictor says taken, and if, the, if a target address for this program counter exists in the BTB, branch target buffer, then the next fetch address is really the target address coming from the branch target buffer. If the direction predictor says not taken, or if it's not a hit, then we fall back to PC plus four, essentially, as the next fetch address. I say instruction size to be general here, but in MIPS, it's PC plus four. So now, this is a more complete fetch engine. Of course, concurrently, you're also a, accessing the instruction memory or instruction cache over here. So all of this is happening concurrently with instruction of cache address. And at the end of this, next fetch address gets lashed to the program counter. In one cycle, you need to do all of this. So now we know how to recognize a taken branch, right? Actually, how to recognize a branch. If a program counter hits in this BTB, then you have previously executed that branch and inserted a target address for it inside the branch target buffer, then that program counter must be a branch. If it misses in the BTB, then you don't know. You, uh, you have not executed this branch, so you didn't insert a target address to the BTB. As a result, this is probably not a branch or a branch that you've not seen before. So predicted not taken. But next time, uh, well, predicted not taken because it's not a hit. Uh, next time, you may actually predict it taken depending on your direction predictor. So we're going to study the direction predictor in much more detail soon. So a more sophisticated direction, uh, branch direction prediction actually looks like this. This part is fine. But basically, we're going to see uh, things like we're going to use the program counter and the global branch history, meaning which direction branches, earlier branches went. And we're going to in, use that to index the direction predictor. And the direction predictor will tell us whether the branch should be predicted taken or not taken. So we're going to use more context information. And we're going to see why this makes sense. OK. So uh, let's recap this. Uh, we require three things to be predicted at the first stage. Branch target address, which can be accomplished using a BTB. We can rem basically we remember the target address computed last time the branch was executed. First can be accomplished using a BTB also, whether the fetch instruction is a branch. If the BTB provides a target address for the program counter, then it must be a branch, obviously, because you should not insert uh, uh, target addresses for program counters that are not branches into the BTB. That's not the function of a BTB. And 
uh, or basically we can uh, store branch metadata bits in the instruction cache or memory and par partially decoding the instruction and storing it in the iCache. I'm not going to go into this approach, but some processors actually take this approach also. That leaves us with the conditional branch direction, which is the hardest part. How do we predict the direction? So we're going to cover a bunch of different techniques. Basically, we're going to cover start with simple ones. These are the simple ones. We're going to talk about compile time or static direction prediction schemes. Always take, not taken, always taken are actually somewhat static, scheme, static schemes because you don't need to make a decision dynamically. Backward taken, forward not taken, we're going to cover that. Profile based, we're going to cover that. And we're going to also go into runtime prediction, which is going to be much more dynamic. And we're going to make it even more enhanced. Basically, we're going to enhance the compile time technique by program analysis. And we're going to enhance the runtime technique by actually adding more history and adding more different algorithms, as well as combining different algorithms by making things hybrid. So it's going to be fun. And a lot of people actually uh, developed very innovative and creative algorithms uh, to do the prediction. Let's cover some of the basic ones. We already covered the always not taken one. It's, so advanced is clearly simple to implement. There's no need for BTB, no direction prediction but low accuracy as we discussed. You could improve the accuracy by laying out the code or eliminating the branches, but that turns out to be hard. So basically compiler can lay out the code such that the likely path, frequently executed path is a not taken path. This could lead to more effective prediction, but there are downsides to it as we have discussed earlier. Always taken, you need a BTB for this. Basically whenever you see a branch and if you have a BTB hit, you always predict it taken. No direction prediction needed. BTB is enough. It gives you better accuracy, 60 to 7%. Why? Because most of the branches are taken. I mentioned this last time, actually, or when we covered uh, pipelining a little bit, because most of the branches are loop branches, and usually loops are iterating. Basically, if you have a big loop, for example, if it iterates 100,000 uh, times, you don't mispredict the branch much. Right? If you Basically, loops usually iterate. As a result, they're taken. They have taken branches, so you get better accuracy with always taken prediction. Okay, I already mentioned this basically. Backward branches are usually taken and backward branches are usually loop branches. And backward branches are uh, branches where target address is lower than the branch PC. Okay, that leads to backward taken, forward not taken prediction. It's a form of static prediction also. And the basic idea is to predict the backward branches as taken, others as not taken. And the reason is people have found out that backward branches are loop branches and they're usually taken. Forward branches are non-loop branches and they're usually not taken, or at least, there's no, not a lot of bias in the branches. As a result, back, uh, treat, uh, treating these different branches separately is good. Uh, th that leads to a better accuracy. And you will see this also a static form of prediction because you don't make a dynamic decision based on the branch or program behavior, right? It's really whether the branch goes backwards in the code, the target address is earlier than the branch PC or the target address is later than the branch PC in sequential code. Okay, this is fun, clearly. You can make this more interesting now by uh, putting the compiler to work or the programmer to work. You can make it profile-based. Compiler determines the likely direction for each branch using a profile run and encodes that direction as a hint bit in the branch instruction format. So basically branch instruction format has a hint bit, one bit saying whether this branch is de deemed by the compiler to be likely taken or not taken, okay? And use that bit to guide the prediction. Okay, so this is nice because if, if the compiler says, oh, this branch is almost always taken, it sets the bit to be taken. Uh, if, it, if the compiler figures out uh, some other way using input set, of course, uh, it will set the bit to be not taken. Of course, this requires executing the branch once so that you see the branch target address as well as that bit, right? Uh, but later executions, you can use this profile-based prediction. So the upside of this is it gives you a per branch prediction, right? So the previous prediction mechanisms, always not taken, always taken, backward taken, forward not taken, are really per classes of branches or all branches, right? All branches are treated similarly. Here, you can distinguish between per branch. So it's more accurate than schemes in previous slide. Of course, this is true if the profile is representative. It's always true if the profile is representative, right? The downside is now your ISA requires hint bits in the branch instruction format. <coughs> and accuracy also depends on dynamic branch behavior. So if the branches are biased, this is great. But if the branches are not biased, if it looks like this, so this is basically, I think, 20 iterations of a branch and which direction the branch went. 10 times it went taken, 10 times it went not taken. The compiler has only one bit. It can say taken or not taken. Either way, you get 50% accuracy. If the branch behaves like this, taken, not taken, taken, not taken, taken, not taken, in an interleaved manner, 
in 10 iterations versus 10 iteration taken and 10 iterations not taken, you still get 50% accuracy. So the compiler cannot identify, uh, do well at least with these non-biased branches. And as a result, your accuracy tanks. Uh, but you can see that these actually are quite predictable, right? Uh, if you were a little bit smart, these are these patterns are guessable, if you will, if you recorded the information in hardware, and we'll see that. So the accuracy also depends on the representations of the input set, profile input set, and we discussed this with any profile-based mechanism. If the compiler uh, made a wrong decision, then actually the static branch prediction may become really bad because the compiler may say the branch is taken, so predicted taken, but 100% of the time, the branch becomes not taken at dynamic execution time because the input set is different. Then you have a problem, of course, right? Then this optimization becomes worse in terms of performance. Even a simple uh, not taken prediction would have done better. Okay, there's another approach to static branch prediction. It's called program-based prediction or program analysis-based prediction. It's actually discussed in this beautiful paper, branch prediction for pre free paper. And the idea here is to use heuristics based on program analysis, analyzing the program, not necessarily profile, profile analysis, but analyzing the program and the dependencies and the type of branch instructions to determine a statically predicted reaction by the compiler. So for example, there are many heuristics this paper proposes, but one heuristic is predict branch less than or equal to zero as not taken. Essentially, they, uh, these uh, authors justify this by saying, Usually these branches are not taken because negative integers are used as error values in many programs and branch less than or equal to zero opcodes are used to avoid those error values. So they're usually not taken. And this is reasonable. They analyze a bunch of programs. I don't know if this is still holds because you can see that this paper is almost 30 years old. Another heuristic, predict a branch guarding a loop execution as taken. Basically, usually there, if there's a branch that's guarding the loop execution, if condition is true, execute the loop. Otherwise, don't execute the loop. Then predict the branch such that you will execute the loop, meaning taken. This is because those guard branches are usually, again, protecting against some error values, for example, or boundary conditions, which don't happen as often. Again, these are heuristics, as you can see. They're not rules. Pointer NFP comparisons, if you're comparing two pointers, if you're comparing a pointer to null, for example, predict that it's not going to be equal to null, because again, that's a boundary condition, potentially, or an error condition. Floating point comparisons, again, usually your floating point comparisons are not going to match. So basically, these are heuristics, some example heuristics, which make sense, I think. Uh, but they don't require profile. That's the big upside here. But heuristics may not be representative or good uh, also. That's a downside, as you can see. And requires compiler analysis and ISA support, true for other static methods as well. So these folks show that you get 20% branch misprediction rate as early as 27, 28 years ago. Uh, I don't know of any compiler that really employs all of these. Uh, they usually do profile-based, but some, uh, some may, at a limited manner, can employ this. Okay, let me cover some of these static methods, and we're going to uh, uh, finish the lecture. But the last one, you can basically do everything that we discussed at the programmer level, right? Compiler may do it, uh, either profile-based or heuristic-based, but as a programmer, you can do it also, right? You know your code, you can profile your code, or uh, you can look at your code, you can guess based on the structure, semantic structure of your code. You can say, oh, this branch is going to be likely not taken or likely taken. So basically, the idea is programmer provides a statically predicted direction, sets that bit, hint bit in the ISA. And you can do it in the programming language by using pragmas that qualify a branch as likely taken versus likely not taken. Right? This is called a pragma. I'm going to introduce it in a little bit. But of course, if you're doing it at the programmer level, it doesn't require at least compile time profiling or program analysis, or the programmer needs to do something about it, right? Uh, but uh, at least uh, compiler doesn't get complicated in this case. And programmer, the big advantage of this is that as a programmer, you may know some branches and their semantics, their reasons, and their program behavior better than other analysis techniques. That semantic information you have in your head as an expert programmer usually, which the compiler cannot easily figure out, and certainly other uh, hardware or heuristics may not be able to figure out. So that's the big advantage. Of course, the downside is now you, you require support from the programmer, programming language, compiler, and the ISA as well, so that this gets communicated all the way down into hardware as a hint bit in the ISA. But of course, this will also burden the programmer, right? And it does burden the programmer. Okay, let me talk about pragmas because this relies on pragmas, but basically these are keywords that enable a programmer to convey hints to lower levels of the transformation hierarchy. Uh, and these are some example pragmas that uh, people use in C to convey the direction of a branch. If likely X means 
you're likely going to take this branch and execute this code over here. If unlikely error means you're likely, you're, it's going to be unlikely to take the branch and execute the code that's protected by this if. That's the idea. I mean, this is very simple, hopefully. Many other hints and optimizations can be enabled with programs, uh, pragmas, for example, whether a loop can be parallelized. Uh, you may have seen OpenMP parallel pragma. This is directly from the OpenMP parallel programming description. This directive explicitly instructs the compiler to parallelize the chosen segment of the code. Here, if you look at the likely versus unlikely, you're explicitly instructing the compiler to add a hint bit saying this branch is likely taken and this branch is unlikely taken, right? That's the idea. So you need the sort of uh, programming language support. Okay, so we're almost done with static branch prediction. Essentially, all previous techniques can be combined also. Uh, it's obvious again, right? Uh, like everything else that we discussed, you can combine many different techniques. You can combine uh, static branch prediction techniques also. The question is how, of course, and I'm going to uh, leave you with that almost, with the, with the questions on this slide, essentially. How would you combine them? When does, so do you override the decision of the program? If, you have, if you're a compiler, do you override the decision of the program? Who do you trust more, basically? That's a tough question, actually. What is the common disadvantage of all three techniques? Well, I've already given you the idea, basically. We've kind of discussed that, basically. If, if the behavior of the program changes at runtime, you cannot adapt to dynamic changes because you have a single hint bit saying this branch is likely taken or not taken. And that bit doesn't change during the execution, which means that you cannot adapt to dynamic changes in branch behavior during runtime. And this can be mitigated by a dynamic compiler, like a just-in-time compiler. And just-in-time compiler, once in a while, recompiles the program and changes those hint bits, for example. But if you do it at a very fine granularity, the dynamic compiler will have a lot of overheads and branches change behavior at a very fine granularity as we will see uh, later on. So what is a dynamic compiler? We've discussed this briefly, actually. It's a JIT just-in-time compiler, a compiler that generates code at runtime, uh, like Java just-in-time compiler, Microsoft common language runtime are examples, but there are new examples also uh, that uh, exist. So certainly these static techniques, every static technique can be made better. Code generation, instruction scheduling, branch prediction, by using dynamic compilers, but dynamic compilers always have overhead, especially if you want to change the code frequently and at fine granularity. Okay, so this is where I'll stop. We've covered compile time, static branch prediction, which is clearly very interesting, but not enough. So in the next lecture, we're gonna start with runtime branch prediction, and we're going to see very, very interesting techniques, including machine learning techniques to improve branch prediction accuracy, and also uh, other human, designed heuristics to improve accuracy. And modern processors actually employ combinations of these different techniques as we will also see. So at this point, I'm going to stop. Uh, I don't think I missed any questions, but if there are any questions, any burning question, let me know right now. Otherwise, we're going to stop. And I, will, uh, I wish you a nice weekend, stay safe, and I will uh, see you next week so that we can pick up from these really exciting algorithms to cover dynamic branch prediction. Okay, take care.